Growing up, I was really connected with a good family friend who was a nurse, and she just exuded compassion and care, and her philosophy that worked for her was no client, no patient needed to die alone. And so she was with my grandfather as he breathed his last. Mm. I heard stories of her being with folks that would hold their hands as they transitioned. But I don't know if there's too much more important than to be able to to be with someone as they transition. Unfortunately for her, she did die alone. Mm, That's that's sad. That's tragic. So just kind of moving up all the years, I worked at uh, University of Washington's Harborview Medical Center in their HIV AIDS uh, outpatient clinic dealing with 18 adults from newly diagnosed all the way through death. Were you working there during the AIDS epidemic? Yes, in the early to mid-90s. And so we would walk into the doctor's room and there would be a blackboard just full of names of people that had died that weekend. Mm -hmm. And we'd walk in every Monday morning and see about 30 or 40 names Then the protease inhibitors made their advent, and I saw people from their deathbed going to full-time work. It was just a magical time. But talking about the transition periods, a 101-year-old gentleman was on our service. His 98-year-old wife took complete control of caring for him, from feeding him one poached egg every morning. (laughs) Like uh, clockwork. (laughs) To cleaning up and repositioning every few hours. She did everything. She barely let the nurse in to do her work, and she allowed me to come in because he really liked me. Mm -hmm. I'd walk in the home and ask for permission to talk to him, and as soon as he saw me, he'd just start crying, and I thought, I can understand that. I walk into the bathroom every morning, and I take a look in the mirror, and I start crying too. (laughs) Anyway, he said, he called me over and said, come over, David, come here. I said, yes, Mr. So-and-so. He said, I can't go. Who's going to take care of her? And I said, I don't know what it would be like to have done everything together for the past 80 years, but I can let you know that we will take really good care of her when you and I can no longer talk. He said, thank you. I know you will take care of her. A couple days later, she comes running up to me and says, David, David, he's hallucinating. And uh, his bed was up against the wall and a great big picture window and nothing but trees. You couldn't see Mm -hmm. anything. It's just trees. And she came up and said, he's saying, see that pond down at the bottom of the hill, the path that goes down to the pond? And she said, no, I don't see it, honey. He kept saying, yes, there's steps, there's pathway down to the pond. I asked her, I said, what's the importance of water, of ponds, rivers, lakes? And she said, that's how we spent our quality time together, at a lake, fishing, just sitting, watching, just being with each other. And I said, well, I think that he's asking you to go with him on a journey that you can't make this time. And it would be okay to let him know that you don't like seeing him in pain and that you'll miss him very much. Mm -hmm. But it's okay to go. And I'll think of you all the time. She went and told him that. And the next day he went down to the pond. Mm. And two weeks later, she, she joined him. Oh, was yeah. So I have one along those lines. This is in my earlier hospice career, different agency, different state. Mm-hmm. There was this lady who had cancer who had an adult family home. That's what we call them up here. A group home for developmentally delayed women. Mm-hmm. She had no children of her own. You know, that was like her family and her husband had done it and her husband had passed away. The problem was finding placement Mm -hmm. for these gals because this is in the San Francisco Bay Area. And this lady started having really bad congestion, terminal congestion. Mm -hmm. She was like, why is she still here? Well, there had been plans for each of her residents except one who she knew was going to be hard to place. Finally, that last resident went to her new home Hmm. at like 4 o'clock. Ten minutes after 4, she Hmm. died. Wow. Wow. It's like she was waiting to know that her charges had all been cared for, and then she could go. You know, her doctor had come and said, oh, you know, she's decaying inside already and all this other Mm -hmm. stuff, but she was still in there. That folks sometimes hang on for whatever needs mm-hmm. to... For closure. For closure, whether it's an anniversary date or mm-hmm. a holiday. Mm-hmm. When I was working in the hospital, we had this gentleman who was a minister. 
he was in there long term. December, and somebody came in and said, don't you want me to put Christmas lights up in your room and so forth? And he said, no. And she said, why not? And he just pointed up. I think it was Christmas Eve. He was alive when the night shift checked on him. Six o'clock in the morning, he'd just gone. Hmm. And he had said he'd be gone by Christmas, and he was. Hmm. One of my favorite stories that you have that I've heard you talk about is the gentleman that lived at the adult family home, Mm -hmm. uh, dementia, but could still converse, and he looked out the picture window. Yes, I remember him. Isn't that a great story? I was thinking about that one. He kept on talking about he was going to get on the boat. He had a boat that was out in the yard. He saw the boat, and eventually he caught his boat. You know, but he kept on talking about the boat out in the yard, and he was going to, he needed to go on his boat. What I remember about that story is, unbeknownst to our client, his son had died. And oh, that's right. Well, and so throughout the day, he would, would say, My son is out there. I'm waving him in, and he won't come in. Mm-hmm. And his son was out going, Come out. Come out to the boat. To the boat. I see. He had died. I think the son had died like the day of or day after those, those stories. And he was unaware. No, I think his son was already dead when he, he was. saw his he son was. waving him in from the boat. Yeah, it was really a beautiful story. He was a nice guy. Yeah. What keeps you going? The satisfaction, the fulfillment of caring for people, especially if we have somebody, say, who we get them and their symptoms aren't well managed, getting them comfortable. Yeah. Or they have a peaceful death or they get the care that they need, knowing that I've helped these people. Being a hospice nurse just feels like who I am. Mm-hmm. Every time I've thought about it, because we all have those days, it's like I can't see myself doing any other kind. Of, I would be happy because I love getting to know the people and mm-hmm. the families and the patients. And what keeps you going? The idea of the honor of just being able to be part of a different family system and working with Kids and teens. Mm -hmm. I love that component. Mm -hmm. For me, it brings it home how special and fragile all life is. One of the things I love is my visits all depend on what a patient needs. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have this form I fill out every time, but they may need me to sit there and hold their hand, or they may need me to sit there and talk to them, or work on symptoms and educate about drugs, or change a catheter. It's different every time. And it can be challenging. I love the variety. Yeah. That's what keeps me coming back every single day. I was hoping it was me, but I guess it's not. Oh, you know. 